evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. If you are new to the channel, please hit like, please hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell as we are constantly adding new programming to the channel all the time. Also, if you have the means and you feel so inclined and you want to help the show grow, become a patron. You get access to all of the After Hours champagne room conversations and you get to have movie night we are going to have another movie night coming up this month we're still trying to work out the date but after the success of the last movie night we're very excited to to do the next one which will be the free state of jones as the movie will be running we just have to make sure the the young man that helps us put movie night together so we can show it uh with with all of you guys on uh on our discord server is able to do it on the night that we have available. We tend to do it at the end of every month. So become a patron and you can be part of that conversation. That being said, let me bring in my homie, my dog. He is the man of the Mau Mau Hour. Also, when you're a patron, you get to be part of the live time Mau Mau Hour where you can actually call in and Mau Mau with Pascal or challenge him on his Mau Mauing. Let me bring in the co-host, my other half, if you will, the Pascal Robert. Woo! Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. So before we bring in our guest, um, a few months, I want to say it's like two months back, maybe even three months back, Two months back, two months back, um, I was approached by, actually last year, I was approached by a young lady from Ben Burgess named Janelle Jolly, who has a show called What's Left to Do. And she interviews leftists and like at their home and asks them their life story. And, and I guess Ben Burgess was like, you want a good interview? You need to go talk to Jason Miles. And so... Um, she drove down from Northern California to Mexico and interviewed me. Oh God. I don't know how long she was here. Probably like three plus hours. Um, it's a funny and somewhat heated conversation. Uh, at a certain point, we've had a conversation about race and class and, um, definitely differed on that. I don't know. <laughs> How the edit of it went for the second part i haven't got to it um so if you guys enjoyed our new york show and the audio only of the of the new york show is up where pascal this ended up being kind of a trip down memory lane for pascal uh you can hear the west coast version of that story in in my life as well and i will put a link in the chat um so we'll see. She put a clip up on Twitter that I retweeted. Where I retweeted it as well. Did you Did you hear the clip where I'm talking I about? I only just like five or six minutes, and I was like, "Wow, this is somewhat interesting. Good sound quality." Oh, she had she look. She's she's not. It's not a game. With this this young lady. She's got a very I great. Tell. I was about to say, like, she seems to be very well resourced. Hmm. She got that Soros money. I'm just, I'm totally kidding. She does not. Have well, I mean, in terms of the professionalism, the professional oh, quality yeah, of the audio yeah. was amazing. And I'm going to, I'm going to refer her some more people um, so that she wanted to talk to. Uh, I would love to hear her talk to, uh, to Ray Reed. Um, a PM say, P PMC says behind the music with Jason Miles. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a bit of a behind the music ish moment. You definitely can hear um, me talk about why I am the way I am, talk about my parents and, and all that fun stuff. But I'll put a link up in this chat to that episode, and you guys can definitely comment on it and and let me know what you think. It definitely does not flow as well as as Pascal's story about his life, <laughs> as his life, as mine was. Um, a, a little less fluid and a little more crazy. 
Makes sense. Heavy, heavy, heavy metal music player. I am. This is this is, this is my this is my ODU. This is a New York band called Anthrax. I'm familiar with Anthrax. Um, hot take: Testament should replace Anthrax on the Big Four. Autumn Leaves says that in the chat. Autumn Leaves. <sighs> I, I don't want to say anything because I feel like someone is going to tell someone from Testament if I say anything bad about them because I actually do know those guys. And uh, we actually, when Testament moved out of their studio, we took over their studio for a while just to record stuff there. And it was a super dope setup. And uh, I have nothing but good things to say about Chuck Billy and and Testament guys. So, I actually wanted to make a couple of uh, statements, actually. One, we did an episode with David Feldman on Monday that was, I thought, one of the best episodes we did took me down a rabbit hole of a subject matter that has been burning my britches for almost a decade, maybe more, which is about the role of philanthropies in American society in the foundation world, and uh, has really made me think that we got to do a show, a series of shows. We're doing a reaction video to Jason's video essay on the subject matter, but that's really about the Bill Gates, Gates Foundation, but we have to do some copious deep dish dives on how capitalism and ruling class in America, that one of the weapons of choice that differentiates the American ruling class from the rest of Anglo-American empire, particularly Great Britain and Europe, is the effective dispatch of the foundation world and largesse. There was a lot of different ways I wanted to go. So also, yeah, uh, we can't believe I'm forgetting that as well. And and thank you for, uh, for our guests for having such patience as we <laughs> get through these plugs. Um, but tomorrow night, uh, this the same time, and it will go off on time because it's automatically set up. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, the video essay is going to premiere. It's called Personal Jesus, the Seduction of Philanthro Capitalism. And I kind of focused on Bill Gates more so than other people. There's a million different ways I wanted to go. Um, thank you, Gene Bajlan, for convincing me to shorten it down. It, it probably would have been an hour and a half, two hours, had I taken every tentacle I wanted to take um, for, for the video essay. Um, I was trying to make it a little more open. Um, I could have done the whole thing and, and probably made it longer if I even would have just stayed on on philanthropic capitalism's role in in black America. And I could have just stayed in contemporary time and it probably would have been longer than it was. It's about a half hour long. So I am <clears throat> very excited to to uh, drop this new video essay. And, and I asked Pascal, I was like, who should we get to uh, do the show with us? And he goes, no one. <laughs> you got material. I got material. We got material for this, baby. He he uh, he he calls me. He calls me and he goes, and I and and I was very worried about this video. It took me a very long time to get done. I was having trouble. Like I said, trouble with the script. Trying to shorten it. Um, getting clips on people like Bill Gates is harder than you think. Um, he doesn't have a lot of media out there that's negative, so I really had to craft it. Anyway, um, so I finally get it all together. I wrapped it at like 3 a.m. I finally got done saying it and getting the meat of the footage, and then the next day I just put the titles and everything together. And I sent it to Pascal and, and a handful of small people who I wanted who I want to get their feedback. And Pascal calls me, he goes, you triggered me with this. And I'm like, in a good way? He goes, yeah. And he just went, he went off and I was like, oh, wow. Been going off for two days. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be, it, it's, it should be a very good recap show. And as you guys know, with the recap show, it's definitely a conversation we're trying to have with, with all of you guys. So we'll definitely be reading the, uh, your, your comments on air. So when we play it back for the audio only, but that is tomorrow night, 
same bat time, 6 p.m. And the recap show will be, we're going live with the recap right after we're done uh, watching the video essay. Um, I hope you guys appreciate it. This video is also the first time I used someone else's music. So a friend of mine has a new album coming out and he gave me some music. So it's not all my music. But let's bring in our guest. He is an instructor at Brock University, Centennial College, and Randolph College. And a while back, hit us up about some critique he has on one Jordan Peterson. And he was giving talks on where he thinks Jordan Peterson goes wrong. Scripture, he's quoting out of context. Great authors, he's literally taking out, of, is he even taking out of context or is he lying? So please welcome Colin Bruce Anthes. Great to be here. So I, I will say this before I, I move out of the way because Pascal has his game face on and has some serious questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I got your message. I read it and I was like, hmm. And everything is, is a group decision, right? It's never me. Ah, we're going to do this. Pascal. Yes. Check this out. And I send Pascal the video and within like 15 minutes, he goes, oh, get this cracker on the show. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. I'm pretty excited. And, and what's funny, when I booked you, when I finally had booked you, he was about to ask about you. It was like, I was like, we're going over our booking schedule. And he's like, okay, I got this show, we got this show, we got this show. And I was like, oh, yeah, I got the Jordan Peterson guy. He's like, I was just about to ask you about the Jordan Peterson guy. That's what your name is in, in our The Jordan Peterson guy. Yeah, now you're Colin. Great. Uh, but before you're a Jordan Peterson guy. <laughs> so I'll move out of the way because I know Pascal's got, got questions. Yes, I do. Well, Colin, I'd like to thank you for coming on This Is Revolution podcast. Thank and you, we're... Uh, going to be talking about someone who was very interesting to me for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. none of them good. But <laughs> um, I don't know if you're familiar with a figure who uh, came about in the early 20th century, whose name was Lothrop Stoddard, who was basically a reactionary intellectual. Are you familiar with Lothrop Stoddard? Uh, only because I saw you post it in the description and I looked it up right before I came on. <laughs> well, basically, he was a reactionary kind of very eugenic scientific racism based well foundation funded a public speaker he debated wb the boys and you know he was basically coming on in the early 20th century to discuss you know the the, the you know the state of the, the white race and so on and so forth all of types of eugenics and uh race speak and one of the theories that i talked to jason about that i kind of follow somewhat is centennialism which is posits the notion that at the beginning of every centennial in the Gregorian calendar under the rise of, since the rise of capitalism, there's always a crisis of capitalism that requires certain phenomenon to be rebranded to kick capitalism into the next century. And in the early 20th, late 19th century, early 20th century, there were debates around immigration, crisis of capitalism, uh, uh, sexual orientation, people like Havelock Ellis, uh, uh, the role of women, uh, reproductive rights, uh, immigration. All of these things were major, major hot button issues going all the way into the 1920s. Eugenics, IQ, uh, intellectual hierarchy, scientific racism. Mm -hmm. All of that now, since we are still in the early part of the millennium, have resurfaced and are still lingering because we're still in this centennial crisis of capitalism. Mm -hmm. And the, the argument that I made is that Jordan Peterson, especially the 21st century ver version of Lothrop Stoddard, in that mm -hmm. he is basically trying to re resurrect white patriarchal masculinity that he feels is falling the wayside because of things like diversity, equ equity, inclusions, all on you know, postmodernism, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. The first line of, uh, of inquiry I want to have is to demonstrate one element of Peterson that I've always found profoundly hypocritical and nonsensical his obsession 
with saying and telling people that they have to abandon ideology, that they need no ideology. And the thing that's so transparently charlatanesque about that is this man is is replete with ideology. His Jungian philosophy, uh, psychology, his uh, you know Judeo-Christian uh, fetishism for biblical for biblical knowledge, his uh, uh, adherence to capitalism, which is an ideology. Can you explain to our audience the bankruptcy of Peterson claiming that he is devoid of ideology and that ideology is a problem, particularly how considering how much of his shtick is rooted in ideology? Well, what I have seen in Peterson is that he is a systematic devil quoting scripture. And that's not something, it, it, it is not an accident. He is separating rhetoric from argument over and over again. He's very good at rhetoric. He is brilliant at rhetoric. And that confuses people because they see he's brilliant at rhetoric and they think that that means this is a very intelligent person telling us true things. Um, his argument is the work of an intellectual mosquito. And once one starts to pull those two things apart uh, and gets a couple examples of what he's doing, you can go through one thing after another after another. Some of the ones that I like to go through are uh, what he says about the road to Wigan Pier versus what's actually in it, uh, what he says about Alexander Solzhenitsyn versus what Solzhenitsyn actually said, what he says about the black wealth statistics, uh, what he says about the innovation behind the iPhone, what's really going on in the universities, where the thre threat of prison labor comes from. You can go through subject after subject. And uh, it's, 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 he, the reason he is such a systematic devil quoting scripture is because he's trying to he is trying to spin hierarchical corporate capitalism as the Western individualist tradition. And that's a square that cannot be circled. You cannot make it fit. And so he is left pulling these rhetorical tricks. Now to speak to a couple of things that you just brought up, they weren't the ones I was gonna lead with. Um, but you mentioned his Judeo-Christian uh, belief system and you mentioned uh, can you repeat the last couple of things just so I make sure I, I hit both? I was talking about the 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 use of J, you know, the uh, po, the, the uh, antagonism towards postmodernism, Jungian Jungian philosophy, uh, philosophy right. psychology. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things right off the bat here. First off, uh, speaking, I'm a, I'm a Canadian as well. That's actually how I started following this guy was because he was a Canadian psychologist who was uh, causing so much controversy, and we all tuned in to see what he was saying. Um, and he started talking about a subject I had studied intimately, but he was implying that the source material said the exact opposite of what it did. And so I wondered how he was going to address that. And then I started watching his YouTube videos and uh, when he didn't address it, and he started hitting on all these other subjects that I had studied and he was doing this over and over again. So I started talking to people who were getting into Jordan Peterson and showing them what his sources said. And then they started to go, oh, that's, that's a problem. And that led to guest talks and making a video and to to me talking a lot about Jordan Peterson for the last half decade. Uh, but right out of the gates here, um, Jordan Peterson as a Christian Canadian who was affiliated with the NDP as a teenager. Now he can get away with this because most of his audience is American or international. Um, but in Canada in 2004, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation held a uh, poll, and I should mention some of the things he is saying about socialists first that I can get to a little later, but he's saying uh, socialists don't really care about the poor, they just hate the rich. It's uh, a spirit of revenge bred by failure against the successful or anyone who isn't at the absolute bottom of the dominance hierarchy. And you should think about that for a very long time because you just don't get gulags out of benevolence. Some people have probably heard these quotes from him many times. Um, in Canada in 2004, there was a poll held by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Who's the greatest Canadian of all time? Now, some of the people who are in the top 10 list are people you've probably heard of, like Alexander Graham Bell or uh, Wayne Gretzky, of course, because it is Canada. Uh, but number one was a guy called Tommy Douglas. Now, Tommy Douglas uh, still has pop culture cred in Canada because his, his grandson is actually Kiefer Sutherland, the actor from 24. Uh, and if you go on YouTube, you can see interviews with Kiefer Sutherland introducing um, uh, animated films to Tommy Douglas's speeches and uh, his Mouseland speech, which is this allegory about a, a, a country of mice electing a government of cats. Um, but uh, Tommy Douglas was a Baptist minister in Canada who was um, very involved in the plight of the poor in the first half of the 20th century. And that got him into socialist politics and he became the Saskatchewan leader of the CCF, the, the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation. 
And from there, he became the first leader of, uh, for there, from there, he be, got elected to the first socialist government in North America in 1944, and then re-elected and re-elected and was premier of Saskatchewan for 17 years. Then he became the first leader of the federal NDP. And he led the NDP from 1961 to 71. That was the Social Democratic Party the CCF morphed into. And that's where Canada gets its single-payer health insurance and where it gets its various other backbone public benefits and uh, uh, regulations. And that's what that Christian socialist, organizing among the poor, socialist parties, socialist movements, implementing socialist policies, uh, so list, lifted the standard of living for poor and working class people in Canada uh, that he was voted the greatest Canadian of all time. Now, when uh, you see Jordan Peterson uh, giving these speeches, and you mention Jungian philosophy or Jungian psychology, I'll get into that in a moment. Um, but the only way he could be giving this impression and saying, you know, he used to work for the federal NDP as a teenager, uh, but then he realized the great flaw of socialism and abandoned his socialist ideology. Uh, the only reason he can get away with that is because when he talks to people who've never heard of Tommy Douglas and he gives this speech, it sure sounds like socialism didn't work. Uh, no, no, that was the thing that was voted greatest Canadian of all time. Uh, so he is pulling these things apart in ways that are completely ridiculous, one subject after another. And it's that extreme every single time. And I, I can go through a long list of examples. But this is only possible for someone who is extraordinarily ideological because like, it's, these are not complicated things. Uh, he's, he's, when you're talking about the greatest Canadian of all time in the socialist history in Canada, and he gives that impression. I mean, you're talking about someone who is, who is viewing everything through an extremely ideological lens and looking for the piece of, uh, piece of scripture that they can take out of context and build a very strange theory on. Uh, so he's doing this across the board. Now, I, I can stop there. I can keep going into Jungian I'd like philosophy. I'd to interject because there's something that's very important. Mm -hmm. This was actually brought to my attention and I have a lot of friends, as you probably know, I have a lot, I, I, there are a lot of Haitians who live in Canada, particularly in Montreal. So I have a lot of family who's Canadian. But it wasn't made alive to me until actually Cuba told me, told me about this. And I was like, yo, what is up with all these reactionaries in Canada? And like Peterson and Stephen Molyneux. And, yeah. Duke, and, and Cuba started laughing. He was like, dude, they're from Alberta. Yeah. I was like, I don't, even, I don't get it. He said, yeah. Alberta, Alberta is basically the Canadian version of clan country. Yeah, we sometimes call it Canada's Texas. It is it is certainly our most right wing province, um, and uh, and that's where Jordan Peterson's from, um, and and that's where the politicians that he's most affiliated with in Canada and, and and the the media outlets that he's most affiliated with in Canada come from. Is yeah, you're absolutely right. It's our most it's by far our most right wing province, uh, and it does have some uh, extremist movements that come out of there. Uh, one of the things that happened in the 1990s coming into the 2000s was a party called the Reform Party came out of Alberta. Now, the Reform Party was basically a Thatcher party, um, and they started to infiltrate politics and they were taking away the Conservative Party's votes in Canada. So the Conservative Party had to merge with them. And the Conservative Party used to be kind of the opposite. Actually, they would have been thought of in Americans would have called the Conservative Party in Canada so a socialist party in the past. They were They were sort of uh, basically where like Elizabeth Warren was. And that was partly because our, his, our conservatives were literally the opposite of American conservatives. They were empire loyalists, the one who lost the revolution. Um, and so they had like kind of an aristocratic vision, but they also believed in the common good. So they were sympathetic to the welfare state. Uh, this transformed them. Uh, the reform party coming in and this merger turned the conservative party into a, a much more radical right-wing party. And right now they're melting down. They're having... Um, re-elections because they just voted out their last guy because they have the sort of factions that you're used to seeing in the Republican Party, where like is, is Rhino and all of that stuff. That's what's happening to the Conservative Party here. Um, and so there's been this major increase in the influence of much more extreme right-wing visions and, and, and right-wing politics uh, in Canada, and it's coming out of that Alberta faction. Uh, that's where the influence is, and that's where Jordan Peterson's base in Canada primarily lies. Can you address particularly his obsession contempt for Marxism and his the tropes that he uses about social I mean the, the biggest the one of the main re reasons I've never taken Jordan Peterson seriously is mm -hmm. that he's talking about all this I said, dude you live in Canada you've had free state health care your whole life you have, <laughs> yeah. your whole life has been bankrolled by the government I mean right. like, like you you you're, you're the epitome of hypocrisy right. show me some courage and move to like 
you know, Texas, the United States, some libertarian fantasy land. Right. I mean, it's so transparently cartoonish to me yeah. that people take this guy seriously. Yeah. When he lives in a state that has like one of the most expansive social welfare programs in the Western Hemisphere. Right. Right. Yeah, like I say, he's he's living in Tommy Douglas's Canada. This is the country that voted the greatest Canadian of all time, a uh, democratic socialist. Uh, who organized socialist movements, socialist governments, socialist policies, uh, and that so raised the standard of living here that he was voted the greatest Canadian of all time. Um, his base does not know that that's that, that that's the case, um, and so he gets away with saying a lot of things that that are pretty much pure nonsense. Um, what is fascinating to me, right, is that Peterson is a function. His popularity obviously is a function of the fact that his audience are too dumb to read anything that will challenge what he says. And most of his audience, a lot of them are men who are profoundly insecure because they themselves can't materially function in a society where there's increasing capitalist protect precarity or like a, an individual I know, you know, tries to posture that he is, you know, effectively, uh, demonstrating patriarchal masculinity as a man and father of four when his wife bankrolls his whole livelihood and his you know, <laughs> childhood was bankrolled by the fact that his mother was a, a, a labor union affiliated registered nurse who right. loves Peterson like he's a deity. But, you know, yeah. there are a lot of like minuscule penis men who are f obsessed with Peterson because of their inability to basically master dealing with women in any way. But mm -hmm. I would like to talk primarily first about his his real, uh, like, you know, bed bug hatred of Marxism and his thoughts on Marxism and what, what, where does that emanate from? Uh, it's a very good question. I'm not entirely sure um, why he is so passionate against Marxism. Uh, what I do know is that uh, his characterizations of Marxism and, and of Marx himself are, again, cartoonish. Like, even just to bring up kind of his, uh, the way he talks about Marx and capitalist inequality, which is, he says, you know, Marx saw the huge inequality that capitalism produced and assumed there is something inherently oppressive about it, but he didn't understand Pareto distributions. Um, it, you can go into how many things about this are wrong, but he, again, misses kind of one of the most important things about Marx's analysis of capitalist inequality is it crashes the economy. Uh, that capitalists run out, that there's a fundamental contradiction at the heart of the relation of capital, that capitalists need customers and the customers are the workers. And so if they're producing $1,000 worth of goods and services a week and they're only being paid six fifty, dollars then they're asked to purchase the goods and services, well, uh, periods of economic growth will be followed by crashes and harsh recessions. Um, the problem with capitalism is you run out of other people's money. Uh, and, and that's at the heart of, of Marx's argument about extreme capitalist inequality. Uh, he doesn't mention it and then goes into a non sequitur about uh, Pareto distributions. So what he's using is like, I don't know why he has a visceral hatred of Marxism and why he's trying to tie it to, in some cases, capitalist corporate consultants. Like he finally just released that list of uh, people that he was calling postmodern neo-Marxists and some of them oh, were well, capitalist yeah, well, corporate consultants. Yeah, well, like Ta-Nehisi Coates, Kimberly Crenshaw, people who are completely like total race reductionist non-Marxists. That's yes. I used to say, I was like, I think Jordan Peterson is a charlatan, but he's at least not a dumb guy. He least he's intelligent. That's when I realized, no, he is kind of dumb. Because people were like, no, Pascal, he's not that bright. I was like, no, I think he's a smart guy. He's just kind of, and he's like, no, he's really not. And now when he, when he put out that list of postmodern yes. uh, neo-Marxists, I was like, mm -hmm. this is laughable. And then, by the way, you know, he took that that tweet down. He took it down a certain moment because it was, it was so... Oh, did he take it down? Yeah, Interesting. yeah it, was, it was so transparently cartoonish. Mm -hmm. At some point, that tweet, that tweet disappeared. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and the, yeah. the, one of the things I found is that you know he's always like, "Oh, the Marxists won't debate me." He dodged Doug Lane. He yes. dodged yeah. uh, Richard Wolf. Wolf. Yes. Zizek, who I don't even think is the most effective, wonderful, compelling individual. He was kind of like a stutter, a st a stuttering jibber jab talking yeah. to Zizek alone. I was yeah. like, this nope. guy is a clown. Yeah. Well, I mean, but the reason he would debate debate uh, uh, Slavoj Žižek and he wouldn't debate Richard Wolf is because Richard Wolf is getting at the heart of the capitalist mode of production, not just platitudes about inequality and there being something inherently oppressive about it, but the Pareto distributions explain it. Žižek is more into psychoanalysis, whereas Richard Wolf is saying, no, this is the mode of production. 
uh, here is a, a different mode of production in work, which the workers own the company and have democratic participation in that company. Um, and that actually really raises some problems for Peterson, who's claiming like that we don't have any way of dealing with the Pareto distribution. It's like, well, no, actually, these kinds of enterprises have above average rates of success and they exist all around the world. And there are very big companies that are organized this way, First like the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation, that, John Lewis Partnership. If you, if you don't mind, I mean, I'm yeah. not, I don't know. I want to demystify all this nonsense yeah. about, you know, talking about Pareto distribution and yeah. first of all, capitalism as all of these systems are ideological superstructures. Okay. Right. In other words, they are only real because people are socialized to believe that they're real. You mm -hmm. want to make capitalism crash, make advertising disappear. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. This isn't mm -hmm. physics. This isn't like a natural law of nature. This is a con game that works because dumb people buy things they don't need. Mm. And they buy things they don't need because they are intoxicated by media projection that tells them they need crap. Mm. Mm. That's how capitalism works. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I there was a study, you know, going into psychology, there was a study that found that uh, when people were given more money and they could do one of two things, one was purchase uh, more commodities uh, and one was uh, purchase more free time to do the things that they really wanted to do um, and uh, didn't have to work as many hours because they had some extra cash that was given to them. The ones who purchased more goods and services or purchased more commodities didn't have any increase in happiness whatsoever. The ones who got more time and more autonomy, uh, they were the ones who who ended up uh, having higher rates of, of happiness. And you could kind of, there was a group called the Frankfurt School, of course, that you could kind of call cultural Marxists. That term was used by anti-Semites really to try and-, yeah, and I hate that and, term because it's, it's, it's just another but, ridiculous charlatan phrase. Yeah, but they were looking, you, you could kind of use it in this sense and that they were using Marx to, anal to analyze cultural activity and looking at how like a commercial worked. And they were saying, well, a commercial uh, is using the things that you really need to sell you the things that you really don't need like personal connection, intimacy, adventure, camaraderie, uh, meaningful work, success at the things that, that matter to you, uh, and using that to sell you, you know, off-road vehicles that never go off-road and, and useless things. And you could, you could have titled this study, uh, psychologists prove cultural, cultural Marxists are correct. <laughs> because you know, listen, listen, by the way, I'm a big, one of the elements or offshoots of orthodox Marxism, because it's really not really that orthodox, is the Frankfurt School. And one of the things, and I love it when, you know, the, the morons who say that like, oh, the Marxism is the problem. And they're talking about how, yes, the media and the, and the things we see in the media. I was like, it's a you dingbat that comes right out of the Frankfurt School. Media criticism, the way in which capital media, media capital in media and commercial media create a certain degradation of the quality of life in order to facilitate consumerism. It's like a core aspect of Frankfurt School analysis. Right. The role of film, the culture industry, the socialization of, of behavior yeah. through, through, through media, which yeah. by the way, the American capitalist government has incorporated intentionally as a means to socially engineer people. All you have to do is read the Kerner Commission report and you can see that. There are thousands of reports that demonstrate how the American ruling class uses commercial media to socially engineer its population. And right. this is something the Frankfurt School was talking about 60, 50, like, you know, in the 50s, 30s, 40s, one yeah. of the 60s. Yeah, you know, no, it, it 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 applies magnificently today. Um, it uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty timeless analysis. Or I, well, I hope it's not timeless analysis. I hope there's an end of capitalism. <laughs> but but so far, it's been timeless analysis for sure. Yeah, absolutely. They called it all ages ago. No, yeah. well, I mean, to, I want I want to answer the question. I ask is, I understand why Peterson hates mm -hmm. Marxism, and I've said this before, Marxism. And I'm, I, I, I use Marxism as a tool to challenge capitalism. I'm not an orthodox Marxism. I appreciate Marxism. I use it as a tool. But I mean, I'm not orthodox. I don't wear it as a fraternity T-shirt or a religion. There are things about it I like a lot. There's some things I don't. I do like dialectical and historical materialism. But the main reason why Peterson doesn't like Marxism is that Marxism 
gives you the tools yeah. to search through the graveyard of carnage of Western civilization and yeah. basically te teaches you basically teaches you how to deconstruct that yeah. and deconstruct how these things got done and how yeah. why they should be altered. And because yeah. Peterson's project is about reifying Western civilization, and the yeah. irony of Peterson's project is that Peterson's golden age is never going to be, say, the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1913, or Canada, or Montreal in, like, you know, 1890. His golden age is a time in which the state capital largesse was providing a quality of life, particularly for white males in America and in Canada, 50s, 60s, and so on and so forth, because of the New Deal and because of the capacity of the state to reify a certain quality of life that made people like him possible, which is when you listen to these reactionary right wingers when they say we want to make America great again. When do they want to they want to make America great again at the time in which America was closest to functioning like a socialist country. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I mean, it to my to my thinking, um, sort of the most important thing that that Bernie Sanders did with his campaign was actually all a history lesson because I think almost anybody born after 1975 had never heard anything about Republicans with an upper tax bracket on the rich of 91% and supporting unions in the mid 20th century. Um, but you're quite you're you're quite right that that you know when when Peterson is talking about this remarkable uh, standard of living that he's kind of claiming as his own uh, as or as the standard that he's arguing for, it comes from an era in which uh, the entire it wasn't just the United States. I mean, this was the entire developed world. And let's be honest also about why that happened. It was because the most advantaged capitalist countries on earth could not stop devolving into world wars and the Great Depression. Uh, and so eventually everything had to change to social democracy because we created a catastrophic collapse. And that's a big part of what the road to Wigan Pier is actually addressing, which he's trying to use as a kind of capitalist propaganda. Uh, but that's that's exactly what the road to Wigan Pier is going into and what Peterson leaves out. Um, can, you, which I'd love can you actually to get into the road to Wigan Pier? Because I, I, yeah. I was actually watching your video again uh, earlier today, and, mm -hmm. I, and I thought it was really interesting because uh, I think you said that Peterson comes out of the Social Democrats in Canada, right? That's right. Yeah, and there, there's there's something alluring when you're recruiting people to your side, so mm -hmm. to speak. When you say, "I've already been on the other side," and yeah. the and the problem with the other side is they don't hate the system; they're just right. jealous of it. Because they don't get to participate it like in it like we do. Because if, if we just try a little harder and, and work a little, it's almost hustle culture speak at this point with him, with a lot of uh, flowery, uh, extremely confusing uh, Jungian sp speak, trying, you know, almost mushed in well, there. Yeah. No reason whatsoever. Yeah. And I, it would, maybe at some point I should talk about Jung as well. Um, but yes. Uh, so uh, Jordan Peterson likes to tell this story. I've seen him tell this story, I think, five times about how as a teenager, he was involved with the Alberta NDP. He sometimes calls this being involved in socialist politics. That's a bit of a stretch. Like I said, the previous party, the CCF and Tommy Douglas do give socialist origins to the NDP. Uh, but the contemporary NDP, especially in Alberta, which is, as Pascal was saying, our most right wing province, is really more um, around where Angela Merkel was in Germany. Uh, they would be considered more of a centrist party outside of North America. But they are the most working class party among the major parties in Alberta, for sure, um, and in general in Canada. Um, so he tells this story about how he was working for them as a teenager, but he liked some members of the Alberta NDP much less than others. Uh, and from this, he builds a very big theory. He says he had an epiphany when he was reading George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier. And he says uh, Orwell, even though he was a socialist, found the fundamental flaw, the great flaw of socialism. Uh, he was trying to figure out why there weren't more socialists in 1930s Great Britain. And he said basically that socialists don't care about the poor. They just hate the rich. And he says that's a totally different set of motivations. Uh, this is what he saw in the members of the NDP that he didn't like so much. They had a spirit of revenge. 
uh, and they were using socialism to mask this and resentment towards the successful, bred by failure, uh, or anyone who wasn't at the absolute bottom of the dominance hierarchy. And he says, you should think about that for a long time because you just don't get gulags out of benevolence. Now, uh, if Orwell had actually said something like that, we would have to accuse him of having an unfalsifiable psychoanalytic theory, uh, that he knows what what socialists are really thinking, whatever their arguments are. But of course, that's not what Orwell did. That's just Peterson. And that has really been central to Peterson building this kind of impenetrable cult, uh, that his followers think they know whatever counterarguments are being presented. They know why those counterarguments are secretly uh, being presented in the first place, that it's resentment and a spirit of revenge, and that they're kind of defending society from the, the trends that could lead to the gulag. Um, Here's what Orwell actually writes. And there are two things here. First, there's what Orwell actually writes. And then there's the reason he's writing it. Now, Peterson gets the first part wrong. And I've seen him get it wrong five times in a row. I've never seen him mention the second part in any of those five times. So the first thing is uh, what Orwell actually writes. He says he's not talking about inequality. He's talking about exploitation. That's the word he uses through the whole book, exploitation. And he says, there are these things called, uh, the, there are these children of the middle classes. And middle classes in the 1930s did not mean um, union worker at General Motors. It meant owners of mid-sized businesses, university professors, corporate lawyers, people who might become millionaires, but not billionaires, people who got rich, but not super rich. And he says, they're children who are, uh, who have never been exploited, have never had to organize in a union, sometimes become what he calls book trained socialists. They basically have posh educations, they read the theory, and they're primarily concerned with their own career advancement. And he says, these book-trained socialists, though they seldom show much compassion or hardly ever show much affection for the exploited, they are perfectly capable of displaying hatred, a queer, theoretical, in vacuo hatred of exploiters. And he says, when the working class sees these wealthy, empty posers, these Hillary Clinton types railing against their former donors, they don't want to follow them as the leaders of the working class, which is what they're trying to position themselves as. And then he says what the flaw is. This is the flaw. This is what Peterson's never mentioned in any of the times that I've seen him tell this story. Peterson's, or Orwell says, when people are being exploited up the wazoo by capitalism and do not get the socialism they so obviously need, and he does say socialism is elementary common sense and blatantly obvious. That's his position, very clear. And he says, they turn fascist. He's writing in 1937. He says, events are moving at an alarming rate. Unless socialism in an effective form can be diffused very widely and very quickly, we cannot be certain that fascism will ever be overthrown. And spoiler alert, they don't get socialism across the people. They get the Second World War, the biggest death count ever, the near extermination of the Jews and the atom bomb. That was the flaw. And I've never seen Orwell mention that part. There's nothing in there about a murderous spirit of revenge bred by failure. There's wealthy, empty posers with a strange theoretical hatred of exploiters, even though they've never been exploited, trying to put themselves in charge of the working class and the working class while having none of it. Uh, but he never mentions this part about if you're exploited by capitalism uh, you're, and you don't get the socialism you so obviously need, you're probably going to turn fascist. And that's, or it's increasingly likely that people will turn fascist. And that's something pretty important after 40 years of neoliberalism with the American life expectancy in steady decline and the far right rising all around the world. Uh, that's, that's a pretty important detail to get right. Well, the thing is even more, I mean, I don't mean to style on a basis. One of the things that's even more comical to me is that Jordan Peterson is a psychologist. He's not even a psychiatrist. He's a psychologist. He literally has a degree and specializes in a profession who anyone does history with that was created to facilitate the function of capitalism mm. psychology was literally created in the 19th century to have people to be able to actually shift from ag agricultural economies and be able to be allocated to be ameliorated into industrial functioning capitalism that's actually mm. one of the origins of psychology yeah, well, I would say, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of truth to that, but I would also say that we um, shouldn't give psychology necessarily over to Jordan Peterson. Um, it's, it seems to me that he does not necessarily have a leg to stand on arguing for hierarchical corporate capitalism uh, in his own field. 
Because we now have decades of research into well-being, life satisfaction, happiness, flourishing, depression, suicide. Uh, they seem to suggest hierarchical corporate free market capitalism might be good advice if you want more people killing themselves. Uh, but otherwise, not so much. It's not clear he has a leg to stand on in his own field. In fact, one of the great ironies of the last half century is a great deal of social democratic policy has been directly rooted in American psychological research. Um, it's, it's not even... Even auxiliary subjects like commodity culture or uh, the well-being of the wealthiest Fortune 500 CEOs compared to the Pennsylvania Amish, like there's really kind of no there there. And we're at a point where the American life expectancy is now steadily declining. That was going on before we got to COVID with the deaths of despair, the opioid epidemic, uh, the massive increase in suicide, youth suicide. It's one of the most astonishing regressions we've ever seen in a society that did not have domestic war or famine. And that's not particularly surprising to people who have been studying psychology. So when we look at how Peterson deals with this rhetorically, um, he, he makes a series of statements that are so out there, so unparsimonious as a theory, that it does not actually address the mainstream research, but it sure sounds like if you forgot what the topic was, you were listening to a genius, right? Um, did you know human beings have a common ancestor with lobsters from hundreds of millions of years ago? And lobsters are biologically programmed to organize according to hierarchy. And there's still a part of our brain that responds automatically to hierarchy because of our common ancestor with lobsters from hundreds of millions of years ago. And corporations have hierarchy and Pareto distributions and prices law say there's nothing inherently oppressive about extreme inequality. And these idiots who want to reduce everything to happiness when a manic person is really happy, way too happy. And you can see how somebody listening to this would think, wow, he said so many things I've never heard of before. He must be brilliant. Uh, he's, you've never heard these things before because if he began by saying what the straightforward relevant research is, uh, he might not be left with a leg to stand on with everything he represents. So I don't know as much as it's true that there are some problems, major problems with the origins of psychology. I wouldn't necessarily hand that field over to Jordan Peterson. No, no, I'm not trying to hand, I'm not trying to listen. There, there are people who are good psychologists. What I'm saying is that, you know, the guy is not a social, he is not an economist. He's not a historian. He's not a policy guy. He's not a physicist. The guy is a psychologist. And yeah. I, I really have a problem with people, even with economics, using mm -hmm. their field of, perfect, uh, of expertise to engage in spurious social science prognostication and theory. As well, we know how in, in, in economics, this starts in the uh, 60s, got of the Chicago school. People don't realize economics was not designed to measure social behavior. It was designed to measure money transactions. That mm -hmm. started with neoliberalism as a means to actually cut the way in which the state spent to improve people's, qual people's quality of life. And now it's considered normative, you know. So in the same way, I see Peterson, who is a psychologist, talking about how all these various spurious phenomenon, you, you are without study, and, 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 and you are right, making these, these, these assumptions to people who are too stupid to, to know any better. And again, I'm not trying to make it seem like I'm a genius, but one of the consequences of not doing this, not only doing this show, one of the consequences for me of having so many friends who are academics, who are specialists in various areas, is that they all, regardless of their politics, tell me how comical Peterson is. And frankly, it demonstrates to me more and more that Peterson is the dumb bastard's intellect version of an intellectual. It's like, you have to be someone who doesn't know real intellectual people to think yeah. that this guy is an intellectual. Because you don't realize how if you talk to people who have mastered the stuff he talks about, they will yeah. cut through it like it's Swiss cheese. Yeah, no, it, that, that, I think that that's very true. Um, I would say that, um, I mean, he's had a lot of help. So, I mean, like I say, until really Bernie Sanders ran for president, uh, not too many people knew that in the mid 20th century, Republicans had an upper tax bracket of 91% on the super rich and supported unions. Uh, we are in very neoliberal schools right now. All the schools of economics are teaching neo neoclassical economic theory. Uh, so uh, our mainstream media is corporations selling advertisements to other corporations. You're, you're kind, I think you're right that he is 
Um, not he's 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 an intellectual mosquito. I do not think that he is he is a real intellectual. But I would hesitate a little bit to say that he's a dumb person's intellectual, just because I think a lot of people have caught on to the fact that the system is rigged, despite being told by all kinds of mainstream media outlets and and politicians that the system is not rigged. Uh, that hasn't manifested itself in the most coherent ways yet, um, and he's taken advantage of that. Uh, but I, I think that people are turning to him because they're, they're looking for answers. And um, he has been very convincing up front, but I don't think it's necessarily, I think that there are people who are questioning things. No, I, I don't think you're think right. I, 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 I think you, you, I appreciate the corrective. I think your corrective is fair. Mm -hmm. I do agree that Peterson, his existence is a product of a, cap, a crisis of capitalism. Mm -hmm. his, yeah. his politics and his aversion to socialism, Marxism, is a direct reaction to the rise of the popularity of mm -hmm. political, political economy as yes. a basis of challenging capitalism. 100%. That 100%. no one thought would be returned since the fall of the Soviet Union, that yeah. would be dead. But since 2008, and particularly with the rise of Sanders, in the most capitalist country in the Western world, yes. had at one point 35 percent of the Democratic Party embracing Bernie Sanders. Yes. And for the ruling class and those who are fans of that capitalist, neoliberal, blood-sucking uh, politics and worldview and economics, that is a massive threat. Yes, yes. That's why yes. the black shattering class has been foisted to deny black people inheriting the socialist and communist and, and anti-capitalist politics that had been part of black life for over a century yes. because the ruling yeah. class realizes that if black people in america catch on to socialism and challenging, challenging capitalism it's a wrap yeah well i mean and, and there are so i'd like to bring up one of the other things that that i i uh, have analyzed with jordan peterson is that um he gave a speech at the manning institute which is a right-wing think tank in Alberta. Again, uh, those were the people who orchestrated that infiltration of the Reform Party that I was talking about earlier. Um, and he says, uh, the problem with these postmodern neo-Marxists is they don't have a shred of gratitude. And he says, the black American community is the 18th wealthiest nation on earth. And he says, relative poverty is a real thing. It matters, it's very hard to deal with, but absolute wealth matters too. And uh, Western capitalist society's ability to produce absolute wealth is quite is absolutely remarkable. Now, um, so he's arguing that because Black Americans yep. are not like you know uh, Malayan blacks who are basically yep. sitting in in deserts with extended bellies and flies on their face because they're starving. Yep. That black Americans should be thankful. Be grateful. So, and here's the thing. At, By the uh, way, you know that it was a degenerate. A lawyer that I know was a Peterson fan, uh, a Haitian Negro of all, who, okay. who literally said, I'm sure he got this from Peterson. Uh, he said, America is a great country because at least it gave black people the legal rights to challenge the Dred Scott decision. Oh, I see. Right. The Dred Scott I decision is a decision that basically decided that black people didn't have the right to be citizens. He, he basically, he was this. this that's, the, this, that's the three quarter, three fifths no, of that's, that's, that's the Constitution. This degenerate oh, okay. was basically saying that what makes American capitalism great in the 19th century is the fact that the, the system was so wonderful. It provided something that you couldn't have gotten, couldn't gotten anywhere else. The fact oh, that I black see. people would, could petition well, for yeah. citizenship, even if it yeah. got denied, is wonderful. So, I mean, that's that it, it's it, it is a very similar kind of rhetoric. And the thing was that at about the same time, and I think it was about the year before, um, the Institute for Policy Studies released research that that, that tracked Black American wealth from 1983 to 2013, 30 years of neoliberalism. They found that Black household wealth, Black American household wealth, had declined by 75% over those 30 years mm. and was on track to be at a median of zero by the mid-21st century. Median of zero by the mid 21st century. This was when he was saying uh, that uh, the problem was that we were not grateful for the ability for this system to produce absolute wealth for people like Black Americans. And to go back to what you were saying earlier, um, I would I would say I think it's it shouldn't be that controversial a statement, except for his party affiliation uh, as a as a leading figure of the Socialist Party. Uh, but when we look at when there was some ability for Black Americans to really procure a, a decent amount of wealth, 
It was the A. Philip Randolph movement, who I think is probably one of the greatest American heroes of the Absolutely. 20th century. And, you know, spending 13 years fighting, beating General Motors lawyers, forming the Sleeping Car Porters Union, uh, threatening a, a march on Washington, which the government buckled, desegregated the military See, jobs by proxy the early post-war jobs. I mean, what is fascinating about that is that when these scumbags, mm -hmm. like this Haitian lawyer degenerate that I'm talking about, yeah. say things like that, they're basically saying that you should be thankful that yes. black people get treated as the best second class citizenship because we all know as black people you are designed you're destined to be a second class citizen anyway yeah 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 right right no it's it's um i mean it's i don't have anything to add to that <laughs> it's, i i i agree completely uh but it's it's it, and it's also just completely incongruent with what the slightest bit of common sense would be like it's just stupid when people are losing 75 percent of their household wealth to say you know the problem is they're not grateful this system is remarkable at producing absolute wealth but also when we look at that history what we see and this is very important uh jordan peterson has kind of positioned this idea that marxism and socialism and socialist movements and again like i say this shouldn't be possible for a canadian who was once affiliated with the NDP, but he positions it as if this is fighting Stalin, as if it was Russian Stalinists, and that mentality is invading these countries now. And, and I think that's what a lot of his followers believe. Really, we're pissing on our ancestors' graves. Like, where do we think the public benefits that we got, the union benefits that we maybe were sometimes able to get that are now being decimated? Where do we think that wealth production came from? Where do we think those progressive taxation movements came from? It was working class movements that were obviously, you know, it had to be our well, ancestors. I mean, yeah, Who else yeah, could it well, be? Some of some of my calls on the show, my flight, but I like I like to take him on on his challenge of Stalin. I was like, OK, all the people who hate Stalin in the Soviet Union, do you want to go back to being peasants 200 years behind the rest of Europe before the Soviet Union? Well, you well, know, what was Russia like goes, before so this, the rise of the Soviet Union? Is, and let's see if you want to go back there. This So uh, if I could bring up Alexander Solzhenitsyn here, um, and uh, it's a little bit more of a, a, a long form critique. So please interrupt me at any time that you need to. But well, why don't we hmm. call you, the time out? Um, you are joining us for the champagne room, right, Colin? Absolutely. Can, can you okay. do like a minute of social too? Because this is gold. I, I, no, I, we got it. We got it. We got a champagne room. It. I know. Um, but I wanna, as as I say that, uh, I'm getting a phone call from uh, Phoenix Joaquin. It's called. Oh, what happened to your hair? You don't know I what have... happened to your hair. Yeah. What happened to it? Oh. <laughs> Yes, I can see you now. You want to say hi to the people before I hang up? You want to say hi to the people so I can go off the air and talk to you? You want to say hi real quick? Okay, hold, hold on. Well, everyone. While we're while we're waiting to go to the after hours, I have a phone call that I have to take with my little one. Why don't you take that? We'll go into the uh, social a little bit, and I we got we got to save it for the the bonus. <laughs> what we do. It's what we do. It's so vast. We have enough to take it to the to, to, Am I right, uh, Colin? There's enough to take it into the after hour. I want to give him a taste because okay, I want. Okay, I will. You know what? Here, let me take my phone. Okay, go ahead. Am please. I going for it? Yes. Yeah. Please. Okay. Yeah. So Solzhenitsyn is someone that Peterson holds up as his greatest hero. Uh, he says this person, under completely unreasonable circumstances, took individual responsibility, uh, wrote the Gulag Archipelago, and helped bring down the Soviet Union. He says the result is 25 years later, Soviet Union's not here. Solzhenitsyn is, and Peterson increasingly is describing himself this way. He says he is running the experiment of, of seeing if telling the truth can save the world. So that's the way he's positioning himself right now. Now, the problem is what Solzhenitsyn wrote about capitalism uh, and what he writes about capitalism, especially in Russia, both before and after the, the Soviet Union, uh, and but then also around the world. So first off, this is very easily fact-checked in a very short book called The Russian Question, which has pages about this big. It's about 120 pages. Uh, first, what he says about 
uh, what led to the Soviet Union and, and what made the Soviet Union so difficult. Um, it's not a particularly complicated theory. It was the czars torturing the living daylights out of people for centuries. The life expectancy prior to the Russian Revolution peaked at 34. At the time of the Russian Revolution was 26. And he identifies a particular moment in which he says the Bolshevik outcome became inevitable. And he says that's when they emancipated the serfs by giving them, uh, without money or profit, throwing them onto a system that had considerations only of profit. The form of capitalism that existed in Russia was kind of quasi-feudal capitalism. That was, the, that was the, uh, the, the NEP, the New Experimental Program, that came out between that was Lenin's uh, 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 experiment with capitalist production in order to generate wealth to industrialize the country. Uh, this was before that. This was in the 1800s with the Emancipation Act. When, oh, okay. uh, the czars, when the czars emancipated the serfs and left them to the form of capitalism that was in Russia, without, it's similar to the Reconstruction era in America, right? They're oh. left without money, without property. And the form of capitalism that Russia was in then so uh, butchered the people of Russia that they ended up poorer than when they were in serfdom. And that's wow. what he identifies as making the Bolshevik outcome inevitable. Then he goes into what happened after the Soviet Union fell. And here, do I have time to go into this or do go I ahead, need to? Let's go. We'll okay. okay, so this was when uh, we got kind of a closed experiment between these two more extreme systems, the Soviet system and what was initially called libertarian capitalism, shortly before it was called gangster capitalism. And this was when Boris Yeltsin came in with his Chicago Boys Economists, as you were talking about Chicago Boys Economists earlier, waving their books of Milton Friedman in the air, saying in six months, the markets would start to correct. In a few years, uh, it would grow into the fourth largest economy on earth. And this is what Solzhenitsyn says about the results. They were given every advantage, by the way. All those Western countries and institutions that were still bragging about destroying the Soviet Union, Bill Clinton, the International Monetary Fund, the G7, the World Bank, they were all backing Boris Yeltsin and his Chicago Boys economists all through the 90s. This is Solzhenitsyn in 1994. Uh, people have despaired and do not see why live, why give birth. We are dying out. The birth rate was so low, the death rate was so high, the Russian population was actually shrinking. The uh, he goes into the statistics about this. The Soviet Union, the worst was still to come. From Soviet levels, Russia crashed further than the Ameri the United States crashed in the Great Depression. It mm. killed millions. And this is ultimately how Putin comes to power, which is very important right now. It contextualizes his leadership. Because in 1999, when things were even worse than Solzhenitsyn was writing in, in 1994, but in 1999, Yeltsin resigns with an apology for his naivete, while the independent Leveda Institute found that 75% of the Russian population said that, that they regretted the fall of the Soviet Union. The number one reason they gave was loss of the economic system. It's about 66% today still. Um, and of the remaining 25%, some said they did not regret it, and some said they were still undecided. I think only 16% of the Russian population said they did not regret the fall of the Soviet Union. And then there's an epilogue. And the epilogue is what he says. It's an address to an international philosophical institute. And Solzhenitsyn says um, that capitalism is alienating the mass of workers around the world, or the mass of people around the world. He says it's pushing us over the cliff of a global environmental disaster. He thanks God the scientists have sounded the alarm. He bemoans the fact that different countries are pursuing their own short-term economic advantage rather than cooperating to solve the environmental crisis. And he says we need to practice uh, we need to practice ethics of, of restraint and principles of restraint and cooperation immediately. And then he says, unless we address the issues that communism sought to address, uh, poverty and the coercive influence of money over our daily lives, uh, then the whole gulag terror that he was writing about with the ar archipelago will come back in full force. So that was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Try and find support for, for Jordan Peterson's position in any of that. No, it's, it's, it's hilarious. And, yeah. you know, uh, the Gulag Archipelago, which we could talk about, you know, again, this, this same degenerate who doesn't know his ass from his elbow is always talking about the Gulag Archipelago. I actually have family who emigrated from Haiti to the Soviet Union, and people who don't know Soviet Soviet history, again, I say this all the time, what was Russia like before the Russian Revolution? Do you have any understanding that Russia was basically a feudal peasant iceberg? That was 200 years beyond behind the rest of Western civilization. And yet in 25 to 30 years, it became the second most powerful superpower in the world. Yeah, I mean, there, there, are, uh, there are lots of problems. And I go into, so I know I, I've got to wrap up here. And I'd love to go into the threat of prison labor. Um, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're, uh, fortunately, I'm in Canada. 
you know, here in the United States where 1% of the population is incarcerated and there's there's uh, hundreds of thousands of laborers rented out to AT&T right now and corporations like that right now. Uh, but this idea that that um, there's some sort of reprieve from in from the, the problems of the Soviet Union to be found in capitalism, uh, it's just like Solzhenitsyn just kind of going through the Russian question with Solzhenitsyn kind of dispels that that illusion pretty quickly. But well, when well, let's, big, someone, one's going to find that. Let's let's put this on hold. Um, I, I'm still having my very very deep dive conversation with my almost four year old. <laughs> Trucks are involved. It's getting serious. <laughs> it's a dump truck now. It's getting serious. So give us a few minutes, guys. If you're a patron, the link is already up. If you're not a patron, it's simple. Patreon.com backslash Bitter Lake Presents. You even get a discount if you pay for the whole year. You get the whole year for like 30 bucks. Bam. So on that note, we are out. <laughs>